to share with you all how we built a decentralized wireless internet service provider in um, rural Oregon. So this is Klatske and I. Um, I've lived here for about 13 years. It's a kind of a typical rural community. It has a sparse population, some challenging geography, large Douglas fir trees, and kind of these hills and mountains. Um, and some folks that are working class and lower income. And like many rural areas, it, it also suffers from lots of folks that don't have very good access. And it's very typical for us to see people in our community with a megabit per second uh, of internet or no access at all because they have satellite or cost is a barrier because it's too expensive. Um, but there is actually other internet service providers in this area that have tried to connect people and, and, and serve these folks and, and not been very successful. And also, in fact, about five years ago, there was a, a million dollar um, USDA rural grant to serve um, a mix of wireless and fiber infrastructure with some of the outlying areas um, that also suffer from many things that we see as very typical with granting programs. There wasn't a lot of accountability. Um, we're not really sure if they actually did, in fact, serve those homes that they, um, they had promised to do. Um, and one of the big key things is there's no sustainability. So the money was dropped into the community, and then as the wireless infrastructure aged, the internet service provider had no incentive to continue to uh, put money and resources back into that connection. And this also isn't the whole story. Um, it's not just that these folks have no internet access. In fact, along kind of that main corridor through town, the, the main highway, internet access is actually very good. Um, you can get some kind of megabits per second and it's fiber and it's affordable. But anything beyond that one, well, that one kind of narrow corridor, um, they, they, there's no ability to get that internet access to those folks in the outlying areas. But there is a, a better way. Uh, instead of one company owning all of the infrastructure of the network, Althea's software lets us leverage the existing homes and businesses in an efficient way and build a decentralized network where our neighbors can pay each other for bandwidth. And this is accomplished by people in the community, you know, people that have their homes or their businesses or a farm. Um, they host some uh, hardware and that might look like, a, like an antenna or some cables and then they get paid automatically with the software to, to host this. Um, and here's an example of what that looks like right here. So um, that top antenna is connected to like a high-speed fiber backhaul in the community. Um, and then that bottom antenna, the long skinny sector antenna, is connected to his, his neighbors. Um, and then both of those cables um, route to the Althea router in his house that provides his internet access, does all the routing and the building automatically. And this creates, you know, sort of a viral incentive for, for a kind of a network growth that, that happens automatically. In fact, um, Matt will, like about once a week, take a bottle of wine to his neighbor's house and see if they want to get connected to the internet. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty effective too, he's done a pretty good job. Um, and, and this is sort of curated with a kind of a local group of, of folks that help if there's problems um, or they want to help get people installed, that kind of thing. Um, and, and this sort of agile configuration lets us like lower the build-out cost. So instead of that one central antenna that um, if you can only get the take rate or that you can only get the people within that few shed of that central antenna, we're able to sort of uh, configure this network in a really agile and dynamic way. Um, and this also creates more, more equitable governance. So here is this kind of an idea of what the internet looks like today, right? So you have um, like discrete connections um, with proprietary hardware from, from each of the internet service providers in your area. Um, and you know, legacy internet users pay high prices for slow speeds because the last mile networks are siloed by this ownership and have a really long, long lock-in. But here's an Althea network. It creates like one open network um, made up of different different owners, and the network uses all these links available to you know dynamically switch between different internet service providers um, using different Althea internet service providers and using all the links available um, using the best speeds and offering having better cheaper internet for everyone. So here's a map. 
of the uh, Klatskanai network, so you can kind of see. So Klatskanai, um, we set up an Althea uh, network, and there's about uh, 40 users on there right now, and um, you can see that sort of agile and different ownership, decentralized ownership that we have here. Each of these different colors is a different relay who is forwarding bandwidth to their neighbors. Um, and, and using their own home um, to put some antenna hardware on, there's another example there, um, to forward bandwidth to their neighbors. And one of the kind of exciting things about Althea is that we use a, a price aware version of our routing protocol. And so what that does is that instead of only selecting the best routes based on the total round trip time, we're also taking the, the cost into effect. And so that makes sort of an automatically competitive link. So not only are people incentivized to set up new links and add more capacity, as if those get too expensive, then people are incentivized to set up competitive links. Um, and we can encrypt, we encrypt the whole network with, with WireGuard um, using a, like what we call the exit node, which is just like a VPN or a server at a data center. Um, and that, that server also, that exit node also um, verifies all the routes and the, the prices that are advertised as well. And uh, this, is, this is done by, by the neighbors paying for the bandwidth uh, with gigabyte, per gigabyte, excuse me, with, um, with Ethereum or XI. So let's meet Linda. So Linda is another one of our relays here. Uh, she's the flower farmer, and she's that, that, that relay you saw in green there on that previous slide, who's kind of out in the valley area. Very difficult to reach area otherwise, and this is sort of the areas that have really, really poor access before. And um, so she, she has their antenna here, again, that's the, that has an incoming connection at the top. Those two connections um, down below those two antennas uh, route to her, her neighbors and um, her router, her Althea router type house does all the routing and the building and also provides her Wi-Fi access in her home or connection um, automatically. So for her, she just gets her internet and um, her cost is offset from the, uh, the like about six connections that she has on the, on her, that are connected to her. And um, you can see, this is kind of like an ether scan, it's kind of blurry, but you can see the connections um, going out for her, for her usage and coming in from her, um, her connected neighbors. And here's some of Linda's connected neighbors. So this is also a really great case too. This is, um, this is Clark here and he, um, he's up on the hill from Linda and so he actually is another hop and then serves way out to the very far uh, reaches of the valley there and a really hard, very, very difficult to get area that we would not be able to get otherwise. And um, you know, it's an example of uh, one of the, the farmers and then this antenna at the top I don't have a picture of her, but this is an antenna that is on Beatrice's house, and this is one of these really like exciting stories about how this technology really makes an impact on our communities. Beatrice had no internet for four years um, prior to this because of cost, and um, you know she's a, a I think about sixteen, I think, or something. So her and her. Um, like four or five siblings were staying late after school or going to the library to use the internet to do their work. And with her, her parents had also worked, you know, they worked a couple jobs, and so they, the family just never saw each other. This was really, you know, just impacting their quality of life. Um, so she was able to get connected to her, her neighbor Linda told her about it, and they got connected, and she's able to, you know, you know, pay for what she uses, and it's affordable. And it's you know 40, 50 megabits a second instead of you know the the only other alternative is like um, you know a megabit per second. So, so when we you know I would see her the day that we set it up, she came out holding her laptop, just saying you know this is this is the best day ever. And um, I, I think it really is amazing to see those those values in place. Um, and another thing that I think is kind of interesting is that when we first set this project up, we, we sold my neighbors and my community members on faster internet, cheaper internet, and those just you know, really simple value propositions. But as the network has evolved and we added more people, I start to hear people talk about ownership and choice and some of these other ideals that you know, we envision with decentralized networks. So this is an example of um, like, you know, when we have multiple connections, it's sort of redundancy and resiliency that we get with these networks as well. 
So both of these antennas are connected to different relays. It's actually it's be kind of down in that bottom, bottom right-hand corner there. Um, and uh, this, the routing protocol will select the route on a second-by-second -second basis based on the round trip time and the overall cost. So um, it also, if, if one of the um, if one of the relays were to go down in this case, everything else would route back through the other relay. So right now, people are using Ethereum um, to to pay for their internet. They buy Ethereum on a, like a, a, coin, a Coinbase app right now, or they could they could buy it with anything, but um, using the debit card and then they send it to their router uh, wallet by scanning a QR code on their, on their router. And the router dashboard then also gives them their billing and their usage information to keep up to date on that. And then when the, um, and, and then when the balance is when they get a text message. So it's really pretty simple um, onboarding process for folks, pretty easy to understand the values there. Um, and, uh, one of the new things that we just recently introduced too is, uh, which is pretty exciting, is that people buy Ethereum and send out the Ethereum to their um, router wallet, but we have a new bridge, so that it'll bridge to, it bridges to XI to stabilize out, and that's all just done seamlessly in the router. Um, and then the, the payment settles when on the on the blockchain when, when the gas is five percent of the total transaction. So you'll see sometimes in high gas times, you know, they won't settle for an hour or two or something. Um, so, I did want to just touch briefly as well um, on the fact that these are these are actual like uh, community members that have no experience with Ethereum or cryptocurrency prior to um, ha having to use it to pay for their internet. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty it's pretty exciting stuff. And actually, about a third of my network is senior citizens. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and I, I have found a couple, a couple of things. One is if we spend a little bit of time during that onboarding process on a one-on-one -on -one basis, it, it goes pretty smoothly. Um, and then after that, just sort of initial, maybe even just 10 or 15 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time, folks are able to use that on an ongoing way. Um, a couple of other things I've noticed too is that um, we, we use the terms uh, digital currency instead of crypto and um, a payment app instead of an exchange. And even just sort of simplifying out those two key terms has, has led to, I think, a lot less friction than we normally would have seen. So we do also recognize, though, that um, at, the, at this point, uh, networks aren't, they aren't able to necessarily go totally autonomously. Uh, people do have customer support questions and they might need help um, with things. So we, we have what we call organizers, and this is just you know people within their local community that set up some sort of legal entity. Um, it can be like an LLC, we have that in one of our networks, or a nonprofit or, or cooperative in a couple of them. The one in Cascadia is a member-owned cooperative. Um, and see, so these local people help us all support the network, but they're also incentivized as well. So they're incentivized to, with a monthly prorated subscription fee, which is also automatically debited from the router. Um, seamlessly for the end user. So they can they can partner with other people to set up, um, you know, the relays and the gateways and the other pieces of hardware in the network, but still receive a separate incentive. So beyond Oregon, beyond the rural environment, we're really excited um, to see some of these new networks coming on board here very, very, very soon. This is Tacoma Cooperative Network. They're in an urban area south of Seattle, uh, Washington, and um, they should be launching here within the next 60 days. Um, they, we, we took them through what we call our Althea Hits program. So that's basically a pre-registration site, and if any of you are familiar with the broadband um, community at all, there's, there's a thing called a Fiberhood. Google did it, where you, how you kind of go into an area and get people to pre-register and kind of front load that user acquisition. And this worked really well. So they, they started out in about June with their pre-registration site, some marketing materials and support from us, and um, they have about uh, they have about 80 people now um, pre-registered and they're ready to go, getting close to their their 100 threshold by the time they actually build out. Um, and we have a couple more networks as well, one in the Napa area of, of California, 
and in um, Abuja, Nigeria, that will be starting as well. And, and more people that are now getting onboarded to the beginning part of this process. We find it takes about, especially since it, it takes a while to get that whole cell fiber connection, it takes people between like four and six months to go from their pre-registration site to shovel in the dirt. So just to kind of surmise, um, Althea networks are owned and, and run by the community they serve, which is another sort of, I think, really excited value proposition is that the, the revenue and the economic potential of the network is, is capped in that community instead of someone coming to the, to the area and extracting that economic benefit. It, it stays there local the community is shared amongst the community members. It has that built-in competition. It's the price where a routing protocol is going to always incentivize people to set up automatic competition. Um, it's a, it creates that automatic sustainability. So as, as the class and I network continues to, to expand, um, there will always be that incentive to add for more bandwidth because it is pay for usage. You always want to allow to have people use more, right, and add in more economic benefit. Um, and it's like a very true peer-to-peer -peer statement that your neighbors pay neighbors for bandwidth. Um, Althea enables communities to set up decentralized networks, creating faster and cheaper internet for everyone. Thank you. And I thought, um, if you want, we could do some questions if there's time. Does anybody want to do questions? Sorry. Okay, um, I don't have a, you'll just have to, you know, just talk, yeah. Um, how, how did you convince the people in the first place to, to join your network? So in the end, um, how, because in the end it's like a new room, it's, it's also an investment for them, no? Or don't they have any initial costs when they need to install their tennis? So um, is, the question was, um, you know, how do you convince people to invest in hardware? Um, so if you're talking about in the case of these relays we saw with the antennas, they're, they're, um, there's a very easy ROI. So like Linda's making 100 bucks every couple of months. Um, so it's pretty easy to compete with six users. So as she has four users, you can look at what that is per month. Um, and I think she has about you know six or seven hundred dollars worth of antenna equipment on her on her on her place. So organizers kind of help inter interface with relays and let them know about what they can expect in terms of cost for the equipment and um, what and what they can expect for revenue. Was that, was that your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the router is a one-time one-time fee. The, the router the, 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 the router hardware is a one-time fee. Uh, yes, yeah, so different hard. networks set this up differently. So they like the, the old film network. Um, it's it's a higher income area, so they, they pay up front for the equipment um, and the installation. Whereas in like the network in the Tacoma Cooperative Network, it's a lower income area, so the organizers are subsidizing some of that cost as well. I um, mean, I have a router here too, so if anybody wants to buy me later, you can poke at the dashboard a little bit. Um, I, I think I think you've been asking for a while, yeah. Uh, sorry if you already said it, I didn't quite catch it. Um, like legal issues with the ISPs, uh, is this basically like one contract for one consumer and then they're sharing it? How are you communicating with a backbone owner and would there be any potential like uh, friction there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so when we set these networks up, we, we bring in a wholesale connection. That's the resellable connection, and we, and we call that the, the gateway, right? So someone in that network is actually buying resellable backhaul direct internet access or transit or transfer or so something that's resellable, right? And then from that anchor point, then, then all of course all the relays can resell that, no problem, no one at the, the Althea Network's gonna ask about that. As far as legal issues in the United States, it's very, very simple for ISPs. You just have to fill out a Form 477, which um, they've indicated to us that we do because uh, or whoever's doing the exit node will, will have that responsibility. Uh, you mean some, you say someone, you mean one of the neighbors? Has that subscription or so, so that so that can be a neighbor, but it's, it's what we call the gateway uh, location, and so it basically works like a relay. They get the wholesale fiber back call, and they, they broadcast that out because that wholesale connection is very expensive, though, um, and it's sold on a contract. So that is typically um, a, a business person that, that comes in and does it because it's, it's a little bit longer ROI, a little bit more money, that kind of thing. Uh, you were, sorry, you were citing a protocol or some law in the U.S. I'm not familiar with what it is. So what does it mean? Actually, does it mean that the re person running the exit node is responsible for the content or the, or the communications of 
yes. the community. So uh, how, how, how are the, not the legal issues, but like, have there been any episodes of somebody downloading something and somebody getting in trouble? Uh, not, not, not yet, and I'm sure there will be. But um, yeah, that's the responsibility. And, and this, for the network we have here, Alfie is running the exit mode for that. And the, the vision is the user will have many different exit modes that they can choose from. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the point in the internet service provider where your, your, your data is carried out to the rest of the internet. So um, that's always going to be the one who is responsible for that. And we know what the current telecoms are doing there. Yeah, what does the FCC think of the, I mean, obviously not at this level, right? Very nascent level. Just, uh, the FCC regulates sort of banding mm -hmm. in their ways. You're setting up microwave transmitters for unidirectional by the site, right? So, so I, I was just wondering, have you run into any problems with that? Yeah, I mean, it's local jurisdictions, I don't care, but the larger city uh, might have some. So we operate in the unlicensed um, a spectrum of 5 gigahertz, um, so there's, we're, we're compliant there. And, and then in the Tacoma Cooperative Network, we'll be using a mixture of 5 gigahertz, unlicensed spectrum, and 60 gigahertz, which is the millimeter E-band. Um, so we'll be able to push out even higher speeds. Um, but that's all also unlicensed, so uh, you know, free to use within power limits, which the, uh, the antennas are already configured in that way. So in remote areas, the incentives are kind of clear because you don't have much options. But for example, in Hilltop, the community talk about, what's the incentives that people have to go to the troubles to, to join the network? Yeah, well, Hilltop is urban. Um, I think there's about um, 12,000 people in the neighborhood, just in a few blocks, and um, they, they, it's, it's faster than the current offerings. Um, it's going to be less expensive, and it's community run instead of you know the incumbent providers. We've already got 80 people to sign up uh, to start. So. so, do you like find the neighborhoods that make sense to approach and then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we do we do guide some folks. People people usually just come to us and say, hey, I want to run off the network in my neighborhood. It's great. Let's look at. Uh, what we do find is that you know everybody's angry with big telecom, but that anger isn't enough to get people to switch, right? It's like you have a maybe one to three percent take rate based just on people's incumbent anger. Um, but yeah, and really in order to be viable, we do also you know work with people and look at their market fit and you know say, hey, are you going to be able to have traction here? But you know what I will say when we go into these neighborhoods, and I've been to the hilltop neighborhood and, and worked with the organizers there. Everyone wants to be a relay. <laughs> they want to know how they can make money with their, you know, by running out of space on the roof. Sorry, uh, I, I don't remember who's first. I'm so uh, sorry. Uh, I missed the talk, so maybe uh, the beginning of the maybe answer. But how do you uh, there, uh, yourself? How, how do you provide for yourself? Um, do you charge the communities you're working with, or do you have to rely on kind of you know, benevolent donors that help you grow? And my question is, if if we are able to allocate money and we, we, you know, we want to help you kick start because we see the interest. Um, you know, how can we work together in a way that you know, we can drive some of the wealth we control towards you while at the same time benefiting what, what you're doing? If you've got a practical debate. Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, um, so with, 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 sorry. So without having to go into an ICO type or any token that's on. Yeah, so we are not, we're not doing a, a public sale token. Um, so, um, like I said, we always want our, our end users to be able to use um, something easy to get like Ethereum and, and something stable like DAI. So that's the, we, don't, we don't want people that are subscribing to have any kind of... But yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah so the... the, the so the eventual plan, what we're working on now, is that right now, as, as this, these transactions take place, 5% goes to Ethereum miners, right? So our plan is um, that we are going to bridge to an Althea die that, and, and then an Althea token that is built on Cosmos. Um, and then the Althea token holders will be able to collect 5% uh, of the um, of the uh, of the transaction fees in the network. So as 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 the network grows, then we get the, the five percent. So, so you guys have a reserve of the other uh, so, so your business model is the vibration of the token with the network effect. Correct. If you're sitting on something. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, is there a maximum number of relays that can connect one gateway that have um, 
performance issues or is there actual distance too? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, so yes, but Athea itself runs on that consumer heart, heart router in the people's house. So whatever antennas you connect to that, it's agnostic to it. So you saw a lot of ubiquity gear here. The Tacoma Community Cooperative Network is going to be like microtech, 60 gigahertz, that kind of thing. And so each one of those antennas has limitations based on the antenna hardware. So the, the hardware that you saw there, the big sectors, you know, they can take about 30 people without performance, and the smaller ones, the little skinny guy, you know, less than 10. So it, but it's agnostic. So whatever you want to use with it, you could use TV white spaces and, and those antennas, you could um, you can use license, buy sales equipment. So it doesn't matter. You can put fiber between you and an Althea node as well, relay it that way. Do we provide software or? Software. Yeah, so I um, have that since this is a consumer router available online, our software is open WRT based, um, it's open source, and um, you just flash it onto the router itself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Is it still on Raspberry Pis? <laughs> we do. We do still best effort support Raspberry Pi. Oh, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, one thing about Raspberry Pi is, is by the time you um, get the case and you get the Wi-Fi and you get everything else, then yeah, you're at, this is 70 good. bucks on Amazon. So um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been fun. Thank you.